not from PR agency. Um, so, what else you can do is really, I guess, engage your customers. So, you need to make the most of Facebook and Twitter, I guess, to not only you know share with people what you're doing, but actually to shout about your achievements. So, if you get a piece in, um, you know, BNT, or you get a piece in the Australian or the Deal, or I'm trying to think of non-fashion magazines, I'm going well. Um, you know, that's a place that you can put it up on your you know, on your site. And I think, you know, Jody and Michael and team, you guys do a really good job of, of getting people involved in your social media. And that's a really great place to also just see what people's opinions are on certain things or we've got this great new product coming up and people get really excited. And the interesting thing is, is that journalists will often go onto your Facebook, your Twitter, your blog, your site and look for what else you've been up to. So it's a really great place to really keep up to date because they'll just go and do their research there. Like it sort of, you know, takes a whole level out of out of what you're doing. Um, so other things is you know run competitions and promotions because that is the best way to get you know to get that feed through from someone reading your story in the age, and then they might jump onto your website. They might start looking at your content. You know, launching a new product. And all of a sudden, they've gone from reading something about you to con sort of, you know, conversing with you on your platform, whatever they are. Um, and then I guess the other thing is is to, you know, share your media with customers through newsletters, Facebook, Twitter, and get their opinions and things on product. And I guess while this, like, there's a lot, there's a lot to think about with PR, and it really crosses into advertising and it crosses into marketing and, and all that sort of thing, but. If you only do one of these things, or you do two of these things, it's much better than a brand that's your competitor that might not be doing anything. And it's a really sort of slowly, slowly process. Um, and it's exactly the same, you know, if I'm when I'm sitting in a PR agency and working on a client, I'm just doing a slow build. So it's just bits and pieces and mixing them up and doing whatever works best for your business, I guess. So at the end of the day. Don't be afraid to try things and experiment a little. So, you know, be brave. Call a journalist that you read their column every week and you think, I've got something really great that I can offer this person because they will love you for having the initiative as a business owner and having something that you think really will resonate with them to call them and say, hey, I've got this for you. They really love that. Um, and if you don't have the budget to pay a consultant or an agency to be your PR. You know, all you can do, like I guess what you can do, and I've got a few friends that do this, is that they'll just get a free re freelancer to write their copy or to write their pitches, and then you can do the legwork from there. You know, it's sort of quite easy, and it's, and it's also a really good thing for you to be doing in a startup phase of your business, because they're the relationships that you can take forward with you, um, and you can sort of build them as you go. So, questions? Oh wow, was I that thorough? I have questions. <laughs> okay. um, so when you were talking about releasing a statement and putting it yep. at, on all your touch points, mm -hmm. um, is there ever a time where you're potentially exacerbating the story by putting a statement out and pushing it through your networks, mm -hmm. which are potentially your biggest advocates yep. and you're exposing them to something that might be negative that they might not otherwise come across? I mean, is, yep. is there ever that situation? Well, I guess um, it all depends on the situation, which is, you know, it's difficult to understand at the time just how big it's going to get. So I guess the turning point with the situation that I was dealing with was I got one email and you sort of go, is that it? Is, is that all you've got to say? And then by the time it started really picking up, did a bit of Google search and the image of the item that was you know, caused the the uproar was sort of popping up everywhere and hour by hour things started to pick up. Like you don't wait till you've got six hundred emails and go, it's a bit nasty. But once you get to a point where you go, this is gathering momentum and this isn't slowing down, then that's the best time to start putting things on your Facebook on your different touch points. Because when by the time I released a statement to the media on the Saturday afternoon, so this is like 12 hours after I got the first email, Facebook was already active. People were onto Facebook. It wasn't a lot, but there was a few people. And it's always interesting as well, while you're watching things get bigger, and hopefully they won't, 
to check Facebook and see what's going on because it's amazing how quickly people pick things up. And then once it got to that point, I actually had to take Facebook down to moderate it and sort of start putting things, putting our statement up without having people abusing me while I was doing it. Mm. And then I sort of rolled from there. So I guess it's sort of a bit of a suck it and see. And if it's starting to get busier, then that's the best thing to do. And I guess having the statement up on the website and all the different touch points when this particular crisis got to a point where it was front page news, because it was on an international news wire, like just because you're asleep here, you know, if someone's put it on a news wire at 11 o'clock at night down at AAP in the city, and someone's bored overnight and they've gone, right, this is getting busier. And you know, all those people in the newsrooms, they're on Facebook, they're sort of, they're sniffing around and if they see something that might be a bit of a, you know, a crisis or an issue that people really get into, they're going to jump on it. And that way, you know, while it wasn't great that I had to put it up there, it actually saved us because by the time the story appeared the next day, and by appeared, I mean, we had 456 media hits in less than 24 hours, which is, I mean, a PR's dream over the space of five years, but in 24 hours, it was, you know, it was a big deal. But every story that appeared was, this is the issue, this is the brand statement, this is what the brand are doing to stop this issue and stop, you know, um, upsetting and offending people of a certain sort of religious persuasion in India. Mm-hmm. So I guess, you know, you've sort of got to get to a point where you go, how big is this going to be? And I would suggest if that happens, you call someone at that point. Because yeah. it was really, um, we got to the point where we had people burning um, the Australian flag with pictures of my client. So when I got to work on the Monday morning, <laughs> yeah, that was on the serious. homepage of the Australian. Mm. Yeah. And we had 650 comments on the Sydney Morning Herald site. How do you monitor it? So you need it before it gets yep. there, right? Because once, once it's gone there, that's yep. once it's right. And it's no point trying to stop it because it's going to go. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you actually monitor and know? Because often it won't get back to you and talk to the issue, yes. right? Yep. And then you go suddenly go, where'd this come from? Yes. But it's been brewing for a while. Yes. And didn't have a clue. Yeah. So I guess the reason we knew is because people will often just come straight to you. Because it's like the gasp girl. She went straight to gasp. Um, you know, when it came to my client's piece of offensive swimwear, they came straight to the brand because um, if they're really serious about the issue or whatever you've done that's upset them, they'll come straight to you. Um, and then if they don't, it's literally like say, um, say the gasp person had gone straight to the paper instead of telling the store then that is, you know, you would approach it in exactly the same way because, you know, the Herald Sun or the paper in Melbourne would have called you and said, you know, hey, Bruce, this is going on, what do you think? And I, at that point I'd go exactly what I did in the initial situation. I'd go, I've got to call you back. You make the decision, go, you know, you've got five minutes and sometimes you do have five minutes um, and you go, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to resolve the issue and you go from there. So I guess... You know, someone will tell you pretty quickly, is what I'm saying. (laughs) Um, And as soon as, yeah, and as soon as we knew, and because our issue was to do with um, defaming or, you know, using a religious image in an offensive way, it was to do with race and religion and all that sort of thing, you know, (laughs) there was no stopping it. It was, seriously, we made the New York Times on the Monday morning. and I had to call the police in the area that my client lived to warn them because we were getting <laughs> all sorts of calls. Mm. Yeah. How, how did that went out for your client's sales? Oh, they went like through the roof. <laughs> and she's about to be, this is the best bit, she's about to be picked up by a major surf retailer and they wanted to, to take the offending line and put it in store. <laughs> <laughs> And they were like, oh, you know, and I'm like, really? Seriously? No. <laughs> because the thing is, is that um, because they were, they were based in a regional part of Australia, so I couldn't physically be with them. So we had a brand spokesperson in the office and they were doing all the speaking. So I guess because of that, every single um, inquiry came straight through to us as the brand agency and brand spokesperson. So the client or anyone in that business internally, nobody spoke to media. 
So <laughs> they would have put that swimwear in, in the stores. Oh my God, like it would have been horrific. <laughs> like we had sort of um, count, like consulates and different people from India and Australia actually asking us what we were doing because they had to do the Australia-India thing. Like it's gonna be okay, this is the steps the brand's taking. Did they not see this coming? You know what? None of us did. Yeah. Because I guess, and it's happened numerous, numerous times. Like, they threw us into a story where I think it was Galliano. I mean, because obviously he's quite outrageous. So I wasn't too happy about that. Had done something similar using a religious icon. And then another fashion designer who'd done something similar. So I guess... You know, you never, like, you can't always foresee all these situations. Like, you can always sit down and look at a brand and go, right, we're a, you know, <coughs> shoe company. Um, what's the worst thing that can possibly happen? And with this swimwear brand, that's, it's not something that's really on the radar until suddenly it is. So, um, this, and the way that it was interpreted, this swimwear was used, was a celebration of culture. That was the intent of the designer. And she has done, you know, celebrated other cultures and art and all sorts of things since her label was conceived. So it wasn't, you know, plain swimwear, plain swimwear, religious icon, huge uproar. And then, like, you know, so people will... And that's what was interesting, actually, is that people and media looked back at the website. They looked at her previous collections to see if she had been doing really outrageous things before. Now, like, had she just started using artwork on this collection, or you know, did she have any history in this? So that was really interesting that people were actively, and our website was through the roof. Not sure if people were purchasing or looking for somewhere to abuse us, but.